Hi, Dr. Nguenya. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Today we will be discussing congenital melanocytic nevi mm. together with melanoma. So let us start. Sure. What is congenital melanocytic nevi? Well, let's <clears throat> break it down. Congenital means you have it from birth. Melanosis is pigment alteration. So it's hyperpigmentation secondary to increase in melanin. And nevi, I'll just use a colloquial term, it's mole, it's a lesion. So you have this mole that is hyperpigmented that you have from birth. Congenital melanocytic nevi. So how does it come about? Well, now you're speaking to the embryology there of, um, so let's look at it. During the eighth to the 10th week of interuterine life, you have these cells called melanoblasts. Now these um, migrate and they migrate from neural crest cells and they migrate into different regions, the skin, the leptomeninges, the eyes, the ears, and therein they differentiate. And they differentiate into dendritic melanocytes. Now, there may be an abnormality during the development or arrest in the process of migration and differentiation. And that's how you will get these congenital melanocytic nevi. So unlike melanocytes, these nevi cells will lack dendri um, dendrites, amongst other things. So the, there's, of course, molecular or molecular pathology that I don't want to get into, which involves your CMET, your CKID. Um, but maybe what's important for you to know is there's a growth factor called hepatocyte growth factor, um, also known as scatter cells, and these are increased in congenital melanocytic nevi. Okay. Mm. How do you classify it? Simply, this will be based on size. So we look at the size. We can classify them as small, as medium, or giant. So what's small? Small is anything less than 1.5 squared centimeter. Medium, 1.5 to 20 square centimeters and then large is anything greater than 20 square centimeters now mind you i'm giving you um an adulthood size if you may so of course you'd want to diagnose this in a child so in an infant we would interpret this to be anything that's greater than nine centimeters in the scalp or anything greater than six centimeter in the trunk would be diagnostic of congenital melanocytic nevi. Now, throughout this, from small, medium, giant, the pigmentation also gets um, a bit more. And of course, there's hypertrichosis that then increases um, as you go from small, medium, and giant melanocytic nevi. So what is the difference between congenital versus acquired? So, the way the difference you would mainly see it histo um, histopathologically, and that would be the depth that's involved. But clinically, you may also pick it up. Now, congenital melanocytic nevi will you would find them in the lower two thirds of the dermis. So between the collagen bundles, um, you would find a cellular layer there around the skin appendages. You'd find it infiltrating the er erector pili muscles, um, perivascular, perifollicular. You would find it even going down and, you know, infiltrating the subcutaneous tissue as far as the fascia and even muscles. Whereas in acquired, that doesn't happen. It would be limited only to the papillary and upper reticular dermis. Now, clinically, you can pick it up. I mean, if you, there's something that we call kissing nevi, and usually, I'll take my glasses off for this. So usually, if you these would be on the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid, and if you close them, will will form this continuous, uninterrupted, um, you know, it's nevi or circle, if you may. Now, what does that tell you? You see, 
during the 9th to the 20th week of gestation, the eyelids are still fused. Therefore, the nevi will be continuous. But then later in life, when you then look, of course, you can separate them by opening your eyes. Now, this is a telltale sign that, you know, we are able to tell that, ah, this is congenital. This is a non-congenital or rather acquired nevi. So when one sees a patient with a nevi, mm. does one have to do anything about it? Of course, you see, you we're stepping into the management now of nevi, and 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 certainly, um, you would manage, or you can only manage that which you know. So if you can't diagnose this, and you can't tell me if it's risky, you can manage it. So let's jump that phase, which we'll come back into. Now I've diagnosed and I find that this is a benign lesion. Of course, choosing to resect that lesion will only be for functional or cosmesis purposes. Now, if it's malignant, which is what I need to determine, or if it's not malignant, what is the risk of malignant transformation? If that is high, I need to manage it and resect it. Now, the lifetime risk of a congenital melanocytic nevi, depending on which literature you read, but it will give you a variation from 6 to 45% lifetime risks. Now, to manage this, it's dependent on the size. Remember, we spoke about the size when we classified them. So in non-giant nevi, what you would do, you would observe these patients annually looking for any changes. If you pick up any changes, of course, you'd need photographs annually to have a look at this. But if you are suspicious of any changes, you then take a biopsy, send it to the lab, comes back. If it's atypical, you resect. Now, giant melanocytic nevi's congenital, you excise as soon as possible. Why? Because the risk of malignant transformation is greatest in the first decade of life. Now, these, you don't want to play around. You want to resect. We do have means of how we can resect, whether we expand skin, whether we do serial excisions. There are principles. But the principle that I want you to take for your purpose is resect those. Now, how do we treat acquired? Remember, with congenital, you may also get acquired. Or they may be acquired that you get irregardless of size you treat it like any nevi any lesion you want to know is this a melanoma the main thing we're afraid of is melanoma we're afraid of this and so we want to test and check if there is a suspicion of melanoma or malignant transformation we will follow it up or we'll treat it in the same way we will approach or manage any lesion for melanoma. So succinctly, atypical, we want to treat like any lesion um, or the way we manage melanoma. I hear you speaking about melanoma risk. What is melanoma? Melanoma is really, it's a skin cancer that develops from melanocytes. Remember those cells that we spoke about when we spoke about embryology. So um, it's aggressive. It's dangerous. Actually, if you look at the spectrum of skin cancers, it accounts for 4% of all the skin cancers. However, it's responsible for 80% of skin cancer-related deaths. So it's a serious thing that we're talking about. What are the risk factors for melanoma? Look, when we, when we speak about risk factors, we look at two things. <clears throat> and that's how I want you to approach this. When you look at risk factors, you say host factors and environmental factors. Let's start with the host. There's always demographics. So we look at the age. Now, we know that 50% of the skin cancers or melanomas that we are going to get, we find in patients that are 50 years and older. So that's an age risk factor. Sex, there's a slight predominance in females. Males about 1.49, females are looking at 1.7. So generally we can get in females. However, in females we know it's usually associated with um, lesions in the lower limb. Um, then you would get in the trunks. 
Now, race is something that's quite interesting because in race, you find it to be about 10 to 20 times greater risk for Caucasians to get it when comparing to the non-Caucasian or the black population rather. And that, of course, would speak to the skin type. And we use a Fitzpatrick type um, you know, classification for that and anything that's type 1 to type 2. So even in amongst the Caucasians, type 1, type 2, freckle, red hair, um, you know, those pale skin, um, uh, that's the chances um, are much higher of getting melanoma. Now, there's hereditary factors that you must consider. Atypical mole syndromes that are there. There's the FA double M, which is familial, atypical, multiple mole melanoma. Um, that's usually they would have about more than 100 nevi. Now, those patients, um, you need to look very closely because it's a risk factor for melanoma. There's the BK mole syndrome. There's um, Neuseroderma pigmentosa is another, um, you know, congenital abnormality autosomal recessively inherited that you need to work where they can't fix, um, you know, their DNA so well. Um, and you need to look into that actually. And they, they can get any cancers, including melanoma. But just nevi in general, as, as we've spoken about, um, I risk factor, but there are specific nevi, not all nevi. So congenital, we spoke about melanocytic nevi. Remember we said, what? 6%, 6% chance. There's also dysplastic nevi, which 6 to 10% lifetime risk of malignant transformation. There's also just a normal typical nevi or a mole in a patient who's 50 years and above should make you worried. And of course, there are others like Spitz nevi, previous history of melanoma, family history of melanoma, immunosuppression. These are some of the other risk factors that we can attribute to host. Now, environmental, I'm going to only stick to one and I only want you to know one. What is that? That is ultraviolet exposure. UVB, we know it well. That's the one. But do not underestimate UVA, sunbeds. Um, that in itself is a risk factor. How do we know? I mean, if you look at the pathways um, of, 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 you know, UV exposure causing um, in melanoma and how it affects the DNA, I don't want to go too much into detail, but I'll tell you there are two main pathways, the melanin independent um, pathway, which mainly is for the UVB radiation um, and, and, and how it interacts with the DNA there. And then there's the pigment dependent, mainly UVA and how it acts indirectly um, to, to, to alter the DNA in melanocytes. Now, this then tells you that actinic keratosis in itself is an independent risk factor for melanoma. So those are some of the things that we look at when we look at risk factors, man. I hear you talking mm. about all these different lesions. Mm. How does one know which is dangerous and which is innocent? Now, that's a good question. It's a very good question because, I mean, you're going to pick up a patient with many lesions and you're going to need to know what to take out and what not to take out. Now, this speaks to diagnosis. And whenever you are asked the question of diagnosis, I mean, in your exam and everywhere, if someone stops you and I say, give me the diagnosis of melanoma or whatever, you're going to give me these three. You will say, first, history taking. In history, and that's what we spoke about risk factors. This is what I found because these things are adding up. And then my clinical examination, this is what I found, which is what you're asking me. And that's what we'll focus on in this question. And then lastly, investigation in melanoma. We want a histology to give us a clear, definitive diagnosis of what this lesion is based on a pathological report. Now, there are three ways that melanoma is going to present to you. Cutaneously, that's the lesion you are asking about, which we'll speak about, that how do I know that this lesion should worry me? But I need you to keep at the back of your mind that there are two other ways melanoma may present. I won't speak into detail, but I need you to know that. Less than 10% may come 
non-cutaneous lesions. So there may be a lesion on the eye, on the mucosa, whether it's oral, nasal, pharyngeal, sinuses, the vagina, the anus, the rectum. Now, those are some of the places it may come in. Very difficult prognosis, not so good, because we seldom don't see it. Unknown is another one, and that's about 4 to 12% of patients. They come in, you palpate, you go, mm, there's a lump here. You feel that lump, you put in a needle, you bring on, um, you take an FNA, send it to the lab, and it comes and it says melanoma. Now you've got to find where it is. We call that a cup lesion. It's a cancer of unknown primary. Now we need to chase and find out where it is. So remember those, park them. Now let's speak about this cutaneous. The question that you asked, how do I know? How do I know that this lesion is malignant? So I should be highly suspicious of a malignancy when I look at this. Simple mnemonic. A, B, C, D, E. A, what is likely to be a melanoma? A, asymmetry in outline. So asymmetric outline. B, the borders. The borders are often changing, irregular. C, color variation. The dark color, of course, black, highly suspicious. D, diameter. Anything more than five millimeters should ring bells. And of course, an evolving, which is E, um, a lesion. Now, we look at the histology as well. So I said we diagnose with history risk factors. Clinical examination, A, B, C, D, E. Histology, we need a biopsy, a full thickness biopsy. Now, how do you take a biopsy? Small lesion, this is how you take a biopsy. Excision biopsy. Small lesion, excision biopsy. What margin do you go for? One to three millimeter, happy. Remember, this is diagnostic, not therapeutic. But the studies, we are happy. One to three millimeters, margin for an excision biopsy. Now, for larger lesions, you may then want to take an incision biopsy. It's too big to remove an incision biopsy. We usually put those, you know, to low suspicious lesions or in cosmetic areas, um, but preferably a punch biopsy. Five to seven millimeters should suffice. Now, just know that even in that, you may miss deep lesions, but five to centimeters may suffice. Now, how do you fail an exam by telling me you want to take a shave biopsy? That's, we don't mention, we don't take a shave biopsy. But in congenital, um, uh, a rather, the, the lentiginous acral, the ones that are, uh, are, are on the, underneath the nails, those ones, we just need a biopsy. We may need, not need depth, so we can be happy with just having a biopsy. Now, the results that we are going to get, what are we going to do with it? One, it's we are going to know what histological subtype we're dealing with. It gives us an idea. And two, we then know the depth. Very important. We need to know what the depth then is of this melanoma. I'm confused. Are you saying there are different types of melanoma? Certainly, certainly I am. I'm saying there are different types of melanoma, of course. Four main types that I need you to know about. Okay, four main types. Now, the, 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 maybe let me say there are growth patterns that we must know about, okay? Now, they can grow either a, you know, in a radial fashion horizontally, or it may infiltrate and grow in a vertical direction. So these four main types, you will understand their level of aggression based on the, 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 the way that they would grow. And I'll give, it to, I'll give them to you in the most common to the least common, and you should know this. Number one is superficial spreading melanoma. 70% of the melanomas that you see, superficial spreading. Now, this grows horizontally, flat nephi, asymmetrical. This kind of variation, it spreads. Now, it's not to say it does not grow deep. It first starts superficially, but then grows deep if you leave it too long. Then 15 to 30% are going to be your nodular. Oh, that you don't want to have. Aggressive, vertical spread, 
it carries the worst prognosis. Now, these may arise de novo. Actually, more common in males, there's a two to one, um, you know, a ratio, male versus females. And another thing about them is that 5% of these cancers, you will find that they are amelanototic. So some of them, which is, you will speak about, um, and perhaps later on if we get a chance, um, you, what, what that means. Then the third one, about 4 to 10%, will be lentigo maligna. What is that? Oh, if I had to choose one, that's the one I'm taking. It's the least aggressive. Secondary to sunburn most of the time. The precursor lesions usually are there. Um, those freckles, there's actually a term. Uh, I, I, it, it will come back to me. Um, Hutching, Hutchington, Hutchinson uh, freckles um, is where they would, would develop from. And it's usually a radial spread. And then, of course, the last um, but not least, 2 to 8% being your acral lentiginous melanoma. Now, I need you to take this 2 to 8% with a pinch of salt. This is in the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, the subingual regions, protected, sun-protected areas. They grow radially, so we think they should not be problems. However, in non-Caucasian population, and because of where they grow, 35 to 60% of the cancers, malignant melanoma in blacks are actual acral lentiginous melanomas and they are easily missed. Now, there are others that I just need you to know for, for knowing them and naming them. Not too much details. 1% desmoplastic, amelanotic, which I spoke about. That may be tough for us to diagnose. Um, you through just a microscope and you need immunohistological um, stains in order to diagnose it. There's non-cutaneous, as we've mentioned, about 2 to 5%. And then ocular, usually they present. There's about 2 um, to 5% as well that would present, usually because of visual interferences. Um, but what you must know about this is liver, liver mets. Liver mets are very common for these patients. So is it fair to assume that the type of melanoma is the main prognostic factor? Oh, no. No, no, no. Certainly not. Um, I mean, when we speak of prognostic factors, there are other factors. Um, I'll, I'll just name a few. Poor prognostic factors. Age. We know that the older you are, it's a poor prognostic factor. Men, actually. Poor prognostic factors. Why? Maybe I'll tell you. In females, what we know is that it usually happens where? In the extremity, so maybe easier dealt with. Um, and also they have a decreased ulceration incidence. So that's one of those things that are that are that are stated as perhaps why um an explanation for the male um a proper prognostic factor. Head and neck trunk melanomas, proper prognostic factor. Stage the depth of invasion nodes, metastatic visceral, um being the worst, of course. That's a prognostic factor. But what I would like to draw you to, which is the most important, is the depth. And remember I told you we take that histology sample. We spoke about the subtype, but I said it also gives us the depth. Very important. Now, when we get this depth, we classify it according to the clock or the breast classification. We used to hold clock quite high, but it seems we've got to turn around now. And Breslow thickness for us is the strongest predictor of survival. Let's quickly go through them. What's a clock classification? We look at, at the skin. We know the anatomy of the skin, this thick skin and this thin skin. There's the epidermis. So all the way from the stratoconium, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, basali, epidermis, if that's affected, it's one, clock level one. Underneath, is the dermis. Papillary dermis, two. Irreticular dermis, four. In between, three. One, two, three, four. And the subcutaneous, uh, which is the hypodermis, is five. So that's how you base your clock classification. Breslow will look at four things. Number one, is it less than one millimeters? We call that thin melanoma. Is it between one to two millimeters? Intermediate. 
2.124 millimeters intermediate, greater than four millimeters, we get a bit scared now. That is thick melanoma. Now, remember I told you it's got the strongest, or it is the strongest, single most predictor of survival. And I'll, and I'll help you to understand that. Now, when we look at the four, we look at the first, if it's less than one millimeter, the, the, the approximated five-year survival is about 95 to 100. So 95 to 100 percent of the patients in five years will be alive. Now, one to two millimeters, numbers go down. 80 to 96 percent. Let's get a bit lower. If we go 2.1 to 4, 60 to 75 percent. Let's take it one notch lower. If we go lower to thick melanoma, which is more than four millimeters, 50 percent, five year survival. Half of those patients will be alive. Now, how useful is this for us? We take all this information with our history, with our clinical exam, looking how the lesion looks like, ulcerated. We look at the mitotic count and we put them in this, in this, in the staging or classification known as the um, EE that was created by the American Joint Committee on Cancer, the HACC. Um, we used a lot the 2010, I think was the seventh edition. Now we are on the eighth edition, which um, came out in 2017. And then we take all of that and we throw it there and we stage the patient. I don't need you to know the details of the HACC guidelines, but it's what's important to know are the principles thereof and then what will factor into the staging because staging is important. We stage so that we can manage the patient. That's the role of staging. This sounds very serious indeed. So how do you manage a patient with melanoma? Oh, yes, melanoma is very serious. You know, whenever we speak about actually any cancer, whether it's breast cancer, it's colon cancer, what I would advise you is when we speak about management is to break it down. And first to look at, or any cancer, let's look at two things first, two broad principles. First, you must tell me about the resectability. Is the tumor resectable? Then you must tell me about the operability. We don't operate tumors. We operate patients with tumors. So is it resectable? So we look at the patient. If it's an elderly patient, 90 year old, a massive tumor in the floor of the mouth, gone to level five lymph nodes, um, palpating something in the parotid as well. We already know it's a lengthy operation. Patient is on home oxygen, previous MI times 10. Of course, poor, reset, poor operability status. So that patient would rather not operate. So you need a multidisciplinary team. You need the surgeon, the ablative, the reconstructive surgeon, the physician, the, the, the anesthetist must be involved. Your oncologist, radiation oncology, medical oncology, radiologist, psychologist. So you need a group of people to assist you in this. Now we look at the resectability. And so what we see is just the outside. It's the tip of the iceberg. We don't know what's happening inside. And I'm not gifted with those eyes, and I don't think neither are you. So for that, you need imaging to assist you. And so we are going to then do imaging. Do we do imaging on anyone and everyone? No. Who do we image? Stage one, stage two? Broadly, we don't. Remember, I'm speaking broad principles. We individualize, and there's always gray areas. Stage one, stage two, no need for imaging. Stage three, then we image. In our institution, we do a PET CT. For these patients. Am I right? No, we don't usually do it. Some say you can do it, especially depending on which areas, in order to resect. And stage four, of course, we do those investigations, but we would see a metastatic lesion and we'll take an FNA to prove that it indeed it is metastatic. Now, we spoke about the second principle when you manage a cancer, you group it, works easier. You say it's either early, it's locally advanced, no doubt status. Or it's metastatic, meaning there's diff distance met. Now, how do we manage a disease? If it's early melanoma, let's speak about the primary lesion itself. We cut it out. Now, the main question you need to answer is the margins. 
And I'll tell you simply, don't look at and confuse yourself with all these numbers, 0 0.75, 0 0.52, no. Store this in your head. If it's less than one millimeter, one centimeter, mind you. If it's more than one millimeter, two centimeter, mind you. That's enough. Look, there's been many studies to prove this. There's been the Swedish Child World Health Organization, the Integrated Group, the IMST, the French, the Swedish and Danish trials. And all of these looked at the very same thing, saying, look, if it's thin, um, if I take more than one millimeter and I take three, is there a difference? There's no difference. Oh, if I take instead of two for thicker ones and I take five centimeter margin, is there a difference? No difference. One or two centimeters. If it's less than one millimeter or greater than two millimeters, one millimeter, done. Then we look at the depth. How deep do you go? Let me answer that for you. You go up to the fascia layer. Do you take the fascia with you? No. Why? You increase the risk of metastases with no survival benefit. So you go up until the level of the fascia. Of course, you're going to have your sub um, angular um, melanomas under the nails and those ones you amputate. Where do you amputate? Proximal to the distal um, interphalangeal joint. Of course, the thumb would be the proximal interphalangeal joint. So we're done with that. Now, we're concerned about lymph nodes. We want to know, has it gone to lymph nodes? Clinically, it hasn't gone. We're not sure. So we do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Where do we do a sentinel lymph node biopsy? Do we do it on any run? No. What are the indications? I'm going to give you four indications for sentinel lymph node biopsy. One, if it's thickness greater than one millimeter, you do a sentinel lymph node biopsy for that patient. Oh, let's say it's 0 0.76 to one millimeter, but there's ulceration and a mitotic um, count more than one. Those patients, you do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. Or stage 2, or stage 1B, or in transit, stage 3. So those are the patients you do. Of course, we know there is a survival benefit. If you're not sure, look at the, is it 2014, I think, the MSLT1 trial and showed that there is benefit in so doing. Now, the results come back and they come back positive. Now, if they come back positive, what do I do? It means there's cancer there. Or oh, clinically, which means clinical and radiological. And also I took a, 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 a needle and I've got an FNA and it says tumor. There is cancer in the axilla. Those patients are going to have an ex, a, a, a clearance, a lymph node dissection. If it's in the axilla, do we do like breast? No, we go level one level two and level three and if you look at the ncc and guidelines 50 nodes are enough then head and neck i'm going to if i pass that controversial you don't need to know about it if it's in the parotid peritonectomy etc blah 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 let's focus on the groin maybe for you the groin i'm doing a superficial groin dissection i find that there's more than three lymph nodes positive in the groin and I find that actually cloaks node is positive. You then do a complete groin dissection for these patients. Now, the NCCN guidelines will tell you to 10 lymph nodes. We go to generally on average. Now, we know there's an MSL2 trial that has shown there is no overall survival benefit. In fact, there's an increased risk of lymphedema if you do this. However, we know we get regional control, and so some would then continue to do so. Now, there are adjuncts to management. We've resected, we've dealt with the lymph nodes. So what's the adjunct? We have interferon alpha 2B. Interferon alpha 2B, um, what's the indication? Only stage 2B or stage 3. What do I mean by that? Only if there's node-positive disease, or if there is no negative, but the depth um, or the thickness is more than four millimeters, those patients are going to get interferon. How do you give it? Of course, the first month you give it IV um, induction, and then the subsequent 11 months they can get it subcut. That's enough said. Then we go to radiotherapy. 
Radiotherapy, there's a lot being said about it, but I'll give you the indications for radiotherapy. Now, these come from the 2013 CME um, paper that came out. And what does it say? We look at the primary disease, radiotherapy for primary disease, for, for the nodes, and for the metastases. Now, for the for for the primary for the primary disease, we look if it's deeper or thicker than four millimeters, greater than four millimeters. Those patients, you send them for radiotherapy, or if there's a positive margin, or if there's local re re recurrence, or if it's desmoplastic, or others would say lentiginous melanoma as well. Node, if there's extra capsular spread. The size is more than three centimeters. There are more than four nodes or it's a recurrence. Those patients, radiotherapy and metastatic, of course, if there's brain meds or there's bone uh, or skin for palliative care, would then send them. Chemotherapy, palliation. Immunotherapy, you, you can know about that. Um, you just know maybe one or two drugs, you know, there's epilumineb, there's verulinib, there's um, imatinib, there's interleukin-2. Um, what I can say about those drugs, I mean, looking at the studies that have come out, if you compare a placebo and receiving one of those um, immunotherapy, you're looking at about a two to four months difference in survival. Now, these are the studies that have come out. Now, one thing to know, just keep it there, not so much detail for your level, is um, isolated limb, limb perfusion um, with or without hyperthemia and um, infusion. So these we use um, melphalan, um, that's the most commonly used, but you can also use cisplatin. And what do we know? There's no survival benefit. However, there is increased limb salvage. And so for these patients who have lesions um, on these limbs, we can try this um, avenue. So how does one follow up with the patient after management? Look, there are many guidelines to this, NCCN being one of them. So simply I'll say stage 1A and stage 2A, you examine this patient, the skin, you examine the nodes, you will follow them up three to 12 months for the first five years, and then annually. Stage 2B to stage 4, you examine the patient three to six months for the first two years, and then after three to 12 months for the next three years, and then annually thereafter. Of course, you will consider in between every three to 12 months, a CT scan or a PET, depending just to check for metastasis and an MRI um, annually or a CT brain to check for bone metastases. Now, there's something which I like, um, liver function test LDH, which you can look at. Um, and we know even though it's increasing 12% of patients, it's something worth looking at because LDH that's raised may give you alarm bells um, of what you would like to know um, if there's recurrence. And how do you manage recurrence? Re-excision. Re-excision. For regional, we can look at radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Thank you for this lesson, Dr. Ngoyem. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Any further comments from your side? No, I think we've covered mainly everything. It's been a long lesson, um, but we try to squash, you know, congenital nevis um, and melanoma, which is a big topic into this one basket. But take home message is to know that melanoma is dangerous. And Africans will say, so, 4% of skin cancers are melanoma, however, 80% of the deaths, 80% of the deaths of cancers are secondary to melanoma. So it's deadly. And if it's so deadly, we need to diagnose it. And the urgency thereof is imperative. How do we diagnose? Always go back to this. History, risk factors. Examination, A, B, C, D, E. Biopsy is going to give us the type and it will tell us the depth. 
Breslau is what we 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 most interested in. Then we go into management. Is the patient operable? Is the cancer resectable? That's when we'll choose which imaging then we then do. And for the primary cancer, what local excisions? Margins less than one milli one millimeter, one centimeter margin. More than one millimeter, two centimeter margin will suffice. Do I do a sentinel lymph node biopsy? There are indications for that. Greater than one millimeter thickness we spoke about, or 0.76 to one millimeter with ulceration. My totty counts more than one. Of course, we're then going to do it. Um, and of course, the, the other risk factors we spoke about. And if it comes back positive or there's no positive disease, we do a lymph node dissection. Then there are adjuncts, which we spoke about, which is important to know about. And of course, how we follow up the patient to make sure that we don't lose them. Remember the five year period is imperative because that's when recurrence will usually follow up. So I hope this gives you a, a, a thorough understanding of nevi, melanocytic, congenital melanocytic nevi, and melanoma. And it will help you to be able to identify, to treat the patient, and of course, to ACA exams. Thank you.